Hello, everyone, and welcome to our eighth SOMA webinar on magic, science, and society. And thank you for joining us today again. So for the past eight months, we've had amazing webinars, amazing speakers discussing uh, themes such as magic and emotions, magic and creativity, advancing magic through science, or even magic for non-humans. Our theme today is magic and diversity. So as gender and racial stereotypes persist in magic, we will discuss the effects, how they are perpetrated, and how magicians can both individually and collectively create a more stronger, more inclusive community. So I'm excited to moderate today's panel with our amazing lineup of speakers to discuss uh, the subjects and give us some insight about uh, their thoughts. So our panelists today are first Kayla Drescher. She has performed all over the world for clients like Microsoft, IBM, Wells Fargo, and many, many more. You may have seen her on shows like Access Hollywood, Penn and Teller's Fool Us, and NBC's Today Show, where she was crowned the next great magician by David Copperfield. Currently, she can be seen in the world touring show Champions of Magic as the close-up magic expert. And outside of performing, she hosts a great pod podcast in magic, which is called Shizam, and discusses uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity issues. Then today, we also have Julie Eng, who has spent a lifetime in magic. Uh, Julie is the daughter of a Chinese Canadian magician. She grew up working behind the counter of the family's magic shop on the west coast of Canada. There, in her formative years, uh, Julie learned her craft, working side by side with her father and mentor, Tony Eng. After re relocating to Toronto, her magic career, uh, career flourished and she continues to thrive in and around magic. In uh, 20, uh, 2006, sorry, Julie joined Magicana, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to study the study and exploration of magic. And she continues to serve uh, in Magicana today as an ex executive director. Finally, our last speaker is Michaela Oz, who is a graduate from Iowa State University with degrees in business and marketing, and also in women and gender studies. She has been featured in the USA Today, uh, on Penn and Teller's Try This at Home TV special and the Travel Channel. Michaela currently performs, speaks, and teaches all over the United States. So thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts. And without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Kayla. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Drescher. I live in Los Angeles. I've been performing magic since I was seven years old and been doing it as a professional, as my full-time job since 2012, just after I graduated college. Um, my experience in the diversity and inclusion field is uh, pretty vast. I mean, for now, um, currently, I host the podcast called Shizam, which we started four years ago because I was really frustrated with how Basically, since day one of my experience in the magic community, I constantly was feeling like I didn't belong, whether or not that was just a feeling I got or I was directly being told that I didn't belong because I was a girl, because I was a woman, et cetera. And I just had kind of had it. I tried to invoke some change and the people that I was working with did not want to participate in that at all. And so decided, all right, we're just going to do this on our own. And so we started Shazam four years ago in the hope to open up conversations in regards to gender diversity and inclusion in the magic world, help women be a resource for women. And throughout the four years, it's expanded significantly, so significantly to where we are just discussing elements of everything, race, able-bodyism, um, transgendered issues, etc. So there's a lot of uh, conversations happening. And I'd like to say that some of the conversations that are happening in the magic community are because of Shazam. I think um, Shazam has definitely sparked a lot of change, a lot of interest. I know just things we've done behind the scenes and calling magic education companies and magic venues saying, hey, these things need to change. Although we're not taking credit for it, a big part of some of these changes, I think, comes from either because we're doing that work or because our listeners 
are making those calls or sending those emails. And I'm really proud of all of the work that we've done. Also, just because of conversation shifting in society, I think a lot has changed in the last few years. Um, is it still very difficult? Yes, it is. Uh, magic, as you saw in the video, I mentioned magic is written by men and for men. It's written for very masculine men as well. So not just um, not just men in general, but someone who is expected to be uh, a very typical magician, a very, you know, wearing a larger suit with big pockets and suit jackets and such. So it is difficult to kind of break through some of those barriers. When I was seven years old, I walked into a magic club for kids and I was told by all the other kids to leave because girls don't belong in magic. Unless I wanted to be someone's assistant, I should go. Um, and I've heard that many, many times. Um, I've heard elements of that in different varying degrees. Sometimes it's microaggressions and sometimes it's um, full on, you, you're not good enough to be here. And so it's very frustrating, um, but I think the conversations are opening and because of uh, events like today and because people are willing to talk about it, I think a lot's shifting. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. Great, thank you so much. It's good to end on a positive note. We'll probably talk about this more later on. Um, Julie, can I leave it up to you? Yes, and thank you uh, everyone for joining us and for allowing uh, my voice to be a part of this conversation. Um, it's it's very interesting. I, you know, Kayla, I'm listening to you and I hear all the things that you faced and it was amazing because I grew up, as you heard in my introduction, you know, my father was a magician and because of that, my whole experience is completely different. And I'm, I understand, I understand it's very fortunate. Um, I am a Canadian. And I grew up on the West Coast of Canada. My father, Tony Ng, had a magic shop, but he was also a full-time professional magician. I mean, he and my mother raised a family, charging around the city, this is a small city, trying to do magic shows to, to survive and to you know, put food on the table for his family. For my, um, and that was an interesting time. You know, we learned, I learned how to work. I learned the idea of what it was to be in magic. But you have to remember, magic picked me. I did not choose this. It kind of found me. And I think because of that, a lot of things of typical experiences that Kayla has just talked about is so different from my experience. I started very young as well, but I was brought in because someone and, uh, ushered me into that. That is to say my father. So I have, you know, this parent figure, I have approval, I have acceptance, I have exposure, you know, so a lot of these things I want to talk about today, because I think that's a large part of why there are so few women in magic, and there are few women in magic, but there are women in magic. So I think that's another point to remember that before us, there was a large part of um, history where we can look back and realize um, the context of what we see magic in then to where we are today is so incredibly different. The, I really strongly believe that we need to have conversations around its history as well, magic's history as well, so we can understand where we're coming from and what we're fighting against. And as a, as a woman who performs, and I, you know, I, I really have to apologize if it sounds very unusual, but I believe in Canada things are a little different. I think the acceptance level is, is, is different. And I also believe that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of acceptance that I, I perhaps don't see in other places. I haven't lived anywhere else, only in Canada. I've lived on the West Coast. I now live in Ontario in Toronto. It's a very big and, and bustering, blustering city. And when I worked with children in working with the magic program, I see a 50-50 balance in gender and frankly, in diversity inside of all kinds of walks of life of individuals coming to, to our program. Our program is special because it's based inside of a rehabilitation center, at, you know, mostly right now it is, but it was always in an at-risk atmosphere. So I got to see different parts of the city with really different challenges. And because of that, I think magic became this very interesting way of inviting to be inclusive to, I think it was, now that I look back on it, important that someone like me, a woman who is of color, which is a new phrasing for me, frankly, uh, you know, for, again, forgive me, I'm, I've grown up in a time where that wasn't language that we used and it's new vocabulary for me now. But to be that person, to be in the front of the room, to gain the confidence of these children, because I was their, their, their leader, the program leader, and because I was credited as being a magician, 
they saw that as something that's really possible. And I feel like that's something that we can do as a community, as a group, is we can shift our traditional ideas of how we see and view magic collectively and really put a positive turn on how we approach it because coming up against adversarial conversation isn't going to be the answer in, in my opinion. I mean, that's a very Canadian opinion. <laughs> Anyway, um, not the introduction I wanted to give myself, but um, Kayla really got me thinking about a lot there. So I hope that gives you a little insight to where I'm coming from. I'll just speak very quickly also that I'm also part of Magicana. And as uh, it was explained to you, Magicana is an international arts organization. And our whole focus is to explore and advance this art as a performing art. That is to say with all realms and, and all areas, and we're really interested to hearing what can we do as an institution to help forward and support and really further the education into our whole community? We look at magic as something for the public and we see magic enthusiasts as a subset of that public. So we actually want to hear more and we would love to explore this idea to again, become a part of that resource that what Kayla has done with Shazam. We also wanna have that sort of um, area of, int of interest and education as a part of our mandate as well. Thank you so much. So for anyone uh, listening, I really encourage you to check uh, both Kayla's podcast and uh, Magic and Nights. It's great. Michaela? Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Michaela Oz. And uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate to be a part of this conversation today. Um, it's a great lineup and I'm looking forward to kind of sharing my experience. And I think it's really important to mention, especially kind of through the lens that I will be speaking on in a second, that this is my experience. I do not necessarily speak for everybody on behalf of my communities that I belong to. Um, this is my experience and kind of the path that I've guided to get to this point that I'm at. However, um, I wanted to start off at least this little section with kind of an example. So I usually use this to open up when I do like college shows and college speaking events and things of that sort. So if you're willing and able to follow along with this, I would appreciate it whether you can or not. But uh, if you have a cell phone next to you, I would love if you could pull it out right now. And I would love it if everybody right now could take a selfie. Yeah, just take a selfie of yourself. Here we go, so I'll do it as well. Perfect. Next, take that picture and show it to somebody else. Wonderful. And then lock your phones and put them away. Perfect. So what you might have realized when you were looking at that other, when you were looking at that picture of somebody else is that you might have realized that they had a nice smile or that maybe they had something in their teeth or that their hair looked nice which are all like pretty surface level things. However, what you probably didn't realize that you did realize was that, that person wasn't you. You see, that's what it was like for me for the first 18 years of my life, looking at a picture that was never really me. You see, uh, for those of you who don't know, I am transgender. I'm a woman of a trans experience, which means at birth, I was assigned biologically male. And then uh, when I turned 18, I took steps to begin to transition to the person you see now. So uh, I'm gonna be speaking kind of from that viewpoint in today's conversation and what being trans kind of means to me and what that's kind of looked like as I've navigated being a professional magician. I started off by doing magic when I was about four years old. Uh, I, my parents didn't have a ton of money, so I kind of created a lot of props. And I was very fortunate that when I was about 10, I got involved with the local magic club. And yeah, now it's magic's what paid my way through college. However, when it comes to the whole trans side of things, I have always known that something was a little bit different. And I didn't know how to necessarily communicate that with the rest of the world when I was younger. So it was definitely a journey to kind of figure it out. And then by the time when I think I was like, oh man, I had to be about 10 or 12, somewhere around there, uh, the whole Jazz Jennings things came out. And when I think Jazz Jennings at the time was like four or six years old, and she had that special on like the 2020 special that talked about her transition being that age. And I, that was the first moment where I was for sure that that was me. And so I shared that special with my parents and 
at first my parents were very hesitant. So they decided what, what we should put our child in therapy. And what I didn't realize at the time was it was more of like, I, I wouldn't say it was conversion therapy. I would say it was kind of more so like guided Christian therapy, which I have nothing against Christianity or anything like that. But for me at the time, that is not, especially being at that time, there was not a ton of information about being trans. So that was very confusing. And I was kind of learned that I should just push that to the side and I shouldn't talk about it. And that was really confusing for me as a kid. Then I was still doing magic and everything and kind of was doing all of that. And then by the time I got, I, it, was, it would have been about my senior year of high school, I realized that I, I don't know if I can continue like being this person or being this male that everybody else saw me as. So I, there, there hit a point that either I continue living my life as this person and, or, but I just couldn't, I couldn't really see that. I, I tried, I tried to picture that as being a man and all of that. And that was not me at all. The, truly in my heart and my mind, I've never been a guy at all. <laughs> and so then, yeah, my senior year of high school, I started taking steps to start therapy, like hormone replacement therapy and actual therapy and talking about different things. And college was really a big place for me to kind of figure out myself. I kind of like to say the reason I went to college, sure, I got a couple degrees while I was in college, but really the reason I went to college was so I could figure out myself. And now I am able to kind of function in the rest of the world. And that's what college allowed me the opportunity to do was to kind of explore my own identity. And along that time, I paid my way through college by doing um, magic shows, what, both being birthday parties and uh, different things of that sort. And now it's what I have the opportunity to do full time. And throughout that experience, there's been a lot of different issues that have kind of arose. And I can talk about some of those later on um, as far as like public reception go or public perception goes and just narratives getting twisted and different things of that sort. But that's a little bit about my history. And yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. So thanks. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, as Michaela, you just started to um, mention you experienced different types of issues uh, in your life. Um, and I would like to start asking to all of you from your personal experience, um, how do you feel that today the magic community could help build a more inclusive community? Do you have any idea of like first steps that everyone could take, to take right now? I would say the first step that would need to be done is really by starting to foster and cultivate um, different experiences, whether that be in diversity, whether that be in um, like, just to start fostering a different, oh, what am I trying to say? I think the first step would be to start by um, fostering different people that kind of look like us and representation within our fields. I feel like that's always the first step. So giving people who might not necessarily have a platform, a platform to be able to present because I really um, showing us that there's people like us in our field is really a super important step for us to feel like we're recognized and there's others like us. I could not agree more with you, Michaela. And I, I think on behalf of everyone here, just, you know, you're very inspiring to hear, to be so courageous, to share what you have shared with us. So, and I think that's exactly the kind of forum that we're talking about, you know, just being in an, in an inquiry you know, we're not going to solve this problem today. So I think having conversations that give us a chance to, to share freely and safely, and that we can then start exactly, as you said, creating um, a, a, a landscape, you know, a landscape that shows the diversity that it actually exists. I think that magic has a lot of diversity. I think there are quite a few changes in, in recent years um, obviously these last two years have been particularly challenging and interesting and, and important, but it's a part of our history now. So we need to explore all of that and really digest as a community with some guidance. You know, I, I am not educated like you are in, in gender studies, and I would like to learn more about that. 
But I think part of it is having opportunity and opening opportunity in, in areas where they're non-obvious. You know, it was pointed out, I was on Kayla's podcast and one of the great experiences that I had was one of the panelists there, we were talking about diversity and, in, and offering diversity inside of entertainment. And uh, one of the panelists, Courtney Pong said, you know, half of the battle is just getting people to the audition. Are you on a bus route that makes sense? Are you in a part of the city that's safe for that individual to come to? These are things that have never occurred to me, never. And I'm fortunate, you know, I live in an area where I don't have that challenge. I live in a community, I live in a in a relatively um, large and quite diverse here in Toronto, especially, but you know, same thing in the West Coast. But I grew up in a very small town, so I know exactly what you mean about these clusters. You know, we were a Chinese Canadian family, so we were in this cluster. But I never felt that that was a. a I have to be careful here because I'm obviously very visibly you know, different. And I think in my school, when only when I think back now, almost 40 years later, that I realize, I think we're, my sister and I were the only Chinese kids in the whole school. But those never things never occurred to me. So we need to have conversation that educates everyone and, and offers the opportunity that we can share in this way. And again, I'm, I'm just very inspired by your ability to be so forthwith and to stand up for yourself. And I think we need to champion more and more people to do all of these opportunities. And this is what Kayla's podcast really highlights and showcases. Uh, and just going off of that, off of what you've both said, I think people that have points of privilege need to shut up and listen. Uh, I'm one of those people. I'm a cisgendered white woman and I have lots of privilege. I have lots of points that are not points of privilege, but uh, I do, ha I have a lot of that. And four years ago, I didn't know what non-binary pronouns were. And I shut up and listened. And now there are no pronouns in my show. Um, I, there, I didn't know two years ago that so many uh, folks of Asian descent are uh, uncomfortable with when a magician uses Chinese coins. I didn't know that that was uh, some, an issue. And I, listened. Uh, right now, I feel like what we're what we are always kind of butting up against are magicians going, well, I, I am a magician, I've been in this world world forever. And my wife has never had a problem at a magic convention. So therefore, no one has problems in the magic community. And it's like, no, 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 everyone, people do have issues. Shut up and listen. And that's, to me, the first thing that needs to happen. Yes, I would love for magic conventions to just book diversity and not call attention to an all-women show or an all-black magician show. And it just exists. You know, it just is equitable. Well, I look forward to that. We had a convention back, a virtual convention back in May where every single person on the bill was a looked different and it was so amazing and we didn't call attention to it at all it was not a point of sell of marketing of selling nothing it just was and i i would love for that to be an eventual goal but for that to happen everyone's got to be quiet and just listen listen to different people's experiences listen to panels like this listen to conventions that talk about these topics because if we don't listen we're never going to learn and we're never going to grow together i think we have to also ask um, questions about how we look at traditions as well. I think there's some very good traditions. I think there's some very, very limiting traditions. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I was looking at words. So you just spoke, Kayla, about this idea of how do we call attention to certain, um, do we have to do all this work to say this is an all woman show, or this is an all black person show or a Chinese show. I have, I have so many mixed feelings about this. Um, we shouldn't have to do that. It should be a part of you know, we're in a generation where this should be just something that we do, that we just, ha I just looked at the Governor General Awards of Canada, they was just broadcast on, on November 26th. And I'm so proud of my country for the range of, of diversity we saw up there. And I think that there, that means there was a little bit of work that had to go into that to really reach across the diverse spectrum that we have. Canada has its own issues right now, as, as we all do. And we need to rect rectify that. We need to recognize that and have that conversation. And that's what was really um, quite striking to me that we can recognize people in this in, in the field of work based on merit, but also to create opportunities to gain 
open up that opportunity for that even to be able to exist. I was looking up the words today, differentiate and novelty. You know, I always thought about that as an interesting way to describe how we bill ourselves in terms of magic. People often ask me when I'm sure you guys get this exact same question. So why are there so few women in magic? You know, and it's, and it's, as Kayla knows, it's not one of my favorite questions. <laughs> we talked about this before. I mean, Kayla, I'm sure you feel the same way. It's like, that's not necessarily the way to maybe phrase that question. But to differentiate ourselves and to not make the idea of diversity, of, of acceptance, a novelty, I think that's the first part of our conversation. It's about looking at how can we shift our way, our lens is exactly as Michaela would say, of looking at how we view each other and ourselves. And now that's that's a tall order. I know that's not gonna change overnight, but magic seems to be a little slow in accepting some of these new ideas and theories. Um, and you know, I look at that, I look at what the work we do at Magicana and it's about, wow, it's a lot of celebration of magic and it's of a very particular group. You know, and that's, it's a burden to me now because I'm, I really have to look at that and to say, well, why, why is that? So such a focus. Yeah. There are that, there are that, that great field. And I, and I'm, I'm kind of new to the history of magic. And yet I think that there's a lot more that we can open up and explore. So I think that's another part of the way we can, to answer your question, Alice, in a really roundabout way, how we can expand this idea of how we can change and create more diversity and inclusion. It's you just really you mentioned uh, earlier that you felt things are evolving, particularly in the last years. Maybe it, it just made me think uh, last year, the Magic Castle was like shaken by allegation of racism and sexual misconduct. Do you feel these um, things are like, do you feel things are evolving in the right way with this type of exposure or is it like completely unhelpful? Uh, I can take this one just because I'm, I was in that article. Um, I, I feel like, so specifically with the magic castle, um, and this is really in general. I mean, Julie, you mentioned how magic moves a little bit slower. And I, I genuinely think that's because magic is based off of a world of secrets and holding those secrets. And I think we live in a really specific bubble that where the world has not had to hold us accountable like they have in Hollywood, you know, on TV shows. Um, the world has been able to hold big names accountable where in magic, the world doesn't know much about us. So they haven't had to hold us to that standard. And this article came out about the Magic Castle, a massive uh, magic venue in Hollywood, world famous. It's the mecca of magic as it calls itself and it's got a lot of issues and uh, as someone who is within the threads of the magic castle i can tell you those issues are very prominent um i think that when the article came out there was a very quick need to make changes and then when the article died down when the the buzz died down the changes stopped happening. Now, staff wise, I can't speak to staff. There were kind of two parts to that article. One was the staff side and one was the, the membership side. And the staff side, from what I see, it's evolving, but I'm not really in that. So I don't want to talk too much about that. I think it seems to be going really well. I can talk about a lot of the points that I'm, I'm seeing that are good, but I'm not an employee. But I can talk about the membership side as a performer. Community wise, I can see things are changing. There's a different atmosphere. Um, people used to just come into my dressing room whenever they wanted. That doesn't happen as much anymore. So that's an exciting change. Um, but I still think there are there are a lot of I think they're the minority, but they're very loud. There are people that oh, uh, these and genuinely this was a post two days ago. These kooks are coming in here trying to change our club. And it's like, well, we just want to be a part of the club. I want to be able to go to the club by myself. And because of experiences I've had there, I will not go in that building alone. I refuse. As a performer, I have someone, I bring my partner with me every single night because I don't know what's going to happen. And because of experiences I've had, I am afraid to be in there by myself. And I don't see that change happening yet. I see 
I see there being when there is talk about it, when there is buzz, then there's, oh, yes, we've made lots of changes. I don't see those changes yet. And as someone who is within really deep into making things happen and making suggestions and being on committees that are pushing forward diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm not seeing that being reciprocated by the people who need to be making those changes. And it's a, it's unfortunate, but I do think because we live in a secret bubble, then we're not being held accountable. And I'm going to keep talking about it until they decide to actually do something. Yeah. And I mean, to kind of just piggyback off of all of that, I think it's really unfortunate that um, I think it's really unfortunate that it seems like there's a small group of people like I think Kayla you said earlier there's a small group of people who really like to push forward this narrative of not changing and I think for any marginalized group that can be the most frustrating part of everything is it's it's so for those of you who don't know earlier uh, this year I was had an incident with uh, in Wyoming and within that incident, uh, essentially lot, the sh shortened version of the story is that there was a group of people who I was supposed to perform at, uh, I was supposed to do six library shows in Wyoming. And then there was a really small group of people who found out that I was trans, it has nothing to do with the show whatsoever, but um, they decided to bang the drum about that. And then there was all these, like there was gonna be protests, I got, threatening calls and messages and all of these same kinds of things. And it seems like it's these people who tend to be, who, who like, who won't sit down and join the table, like it won't sit down and listen to these conversations that we're having that tend to cause the most issues. And for me, that's, that's the most frustrating part of all of this is how do we, how do we get past that? And I think, honestly, I think the way to necessarily kind of combat that is to keep having conversations like this, because the more that we can get other people besides us to talk about these issues is the only way that things are going to happen and change is going to be made. So it's, it's unfortunate. And Kayla, it's interesting to hear kind of your backstory with the castle and when that media article came out I'm, I'm first off i'm glad to hear when that media article came out the magic castle was trying to implement things but it makes me sad to hear that you don't know if change is still necessarily happening but i think the conversations still need to be happening and it's so great that we can still continue conversations like that and kind of hold people accountable so yeah, that you you touched upon this briefly, Kayla. But um, Rachel asks in the chats, why do you think magic is slow in accepting changes that have happened in other fields? So you mentioned secrecy. Do you feel it's there's like other factors that can explain that magic is slow in this type of issues? I I like to kind of put the magic world and the poker industry as kind of two very similar industries. We have very similar statistics. Uh, about 2% of professional poker players identify as women. 2% of professional magicians identify as women. Um, that It's a very low number. They're very similar. And how often do you actually see a game of poker being played? You might see it on ESPN. There are, of course, like big fans, people who play uh, as a hobby when they go to Vegas or something. Magic is very similar. You see maybe a TV special, you might see a magic show, uh, you might uh, know names like Copperfield, David Blaine, etc. But outside of that, most people don't know much about either community. I mean, I, I've experienced so little people say, oh my gosh, it's so nice to see a woman doing magic, unless they're at a, a venue like the Magic Castle or the Chicago Magic Lounge, where it's a little bit more of a stark, like obvious contrast in, in diversity. And so I think because people don't inherently know very much about magic, why would they also hold the magic community accountable for things? Whereas we all found out about Harvey Weinstein. We all found out about Bill Cosby. These are names that we just know, right? They're just prevalent. This is something that the world can go, hey, we're here and we're gonna make sure that these people are held accountable. But you don't hear about magic. You don't hear about the community in that way. And I think that's why it's easy to create a bubble. And, you know, Michaela, I know you just mentioned this, but that's why I think that the Magic Castle 
has been able to kind of go back into some of its old ways because nobody's saying that they're doing wrong. It already happened. Now the buzz is done. So they think. Uh, and so I think that's a that's a really important thing. I mean, I, Michaela, Julie, I don't know if your opinions differ from mine or if you want to add anything, but I think that's that's just my experience. I think it's also I think that's true from what you've experienced and shared. And I also think that it's interesting. I think the public also sees us um, magic through very specific lenses on their experiences of it. So um, when I was smaller, I've always just, I've always looked smaller, looked younger when I was smaller. Like I looked like I was five years old when I was really 12 or seven, you know, like it just, I I just had this, this um, very small and petite uh, affect in in my image. And so when my father took me, this magician who everybody knew, they just assumed that he was going to be the magician because he's the older male, not the white guy, but he was the older male when we came as this pair. And it was assumed that I was just going to assist. Well, that was true. I did assist him in many occasions. That's how I I learned. However, um, it takes that kind of experience for these younger children, who's the birthday party it was for, for my father to say, no, she's the magician. And he steps back and he puts me into that spotlight. We need to see more of that, both mentorship to help forward visibility and again this this idea of access and and um opportunity but we also have to change the perspective of how we are viewed as magicians and magic there i was introduced for the something else just recently and it was for the international brotherhood of magicians i was i was participating as the uh, one of the hat and rabbit clubs ring 17 members and i I said, wow, that's almost an archaic introduction in many ways, because I'm a member, I've been a member of the IBM for, I, I hit my Excalibur, no, the, the 25 year one. So, I mean, it's like, I've been a member a long time and it's like, wow, we still have it. <laughs> I remember it feeling that seems so weird. I'm going to join a fraternity, you know, but my whole experience in magic has been to try and keep up with the guys just as the video was saying earlier, it's it's been defined for men. And I grew up in a time where I had to adapt and adjust to make that work. I was one of those kids trying to wear a big tuxedo. I was wearing boys tuxedo jackets that my mother altered for me. And I was trying to do dove magic because, you know, my father's trying to talk me out of it. He goes, not because I don't want you to do it, because your frame is all wrong for it, given the way you're going to try and do this. We've talked a lot about this. And I had to go through that uncomfortable experience to understand because I wanted to be like the guys. I wanted to join. I wanted to be accepted. I want to be a part of that club. So there's that internal community, but then there's the external. So we have a fraternity, the Society American Magicians. You know, it's this. This, it's it's very exclusive. You know, it's very. It does not invite diversity right off the top. So we really need to examine how do we as the magic community project to the public and how does that shift our, our, our own attitudes and conversations around that so that we perpetuate a different kind of conversation, not the old stagnant ones. I think that sawing a woman in half is an interesting example, right? Everyone seems to know there's Adelaide, you know, she has to do these very extreme and violent acts, you know, to to cause sensation. All right. At least here it's by choice, you know, in other choices, um, women, you know, Mike's book, Mike Caveney just put out this book a hundred years. We've been talking about that, cutting a woman in half. And so, you know, look at you talk about microaggressions. I mean, look at how does that project to the world, how we view women, how we view assistants, how we the subservient roles like you, I could go on for days about it. You know, it's I, I think we're all in the same kind of understanding of that. So it's it's slow because we're slow. We're slow because we hang on to traditions. We're slow because I think that traditions, good or bad, are familiar, you know, um, I want, I love this world. I love the magic community. I've been so embraced. I feel so fortunate, but that's not good enough. You know, now it's time to extend the the tent. We need to expand the definition of what is magic. What is our, our, our membership and how do we allow that to happen in an organic and healthy way? I I'm not interested in conflict battles. I don't think that's going to solve anything. It just divides us and them. And I, I, I don't see that as a positive at all. And we've tried that. It doesn't work. 
So I come from a different way of looking at it, but I, I think those are some of the ways that we can actively do now. We speak about magic differently. We change how seven-year-olds look at magic today. And that's my job. My nephew is seven and he thinks it's very normal that his aunt is a magician. He's very proud of it too. He tells, we went for a cappuccino, he tells the barista. And it's like, I can't be more proud, you know, because he's proud of who I am and how I identify. So I think that it's possible. That's great to hear. I'm just thinking in terms of more of how your performances are perceived and received. Uh, there's a scientific paper by Pascal Gijax and colleagues, uh, which shows that when we show to participants just the hands of the performer with gloves on it, so that they don't see whether it's a woman or a man performing the tricks, uh, and participants are told that it's a woman, they uh, report that the trick is less impressive than when they are told it's a man. Do you feel like like do you feel any? Type, like effects like this in your performances like have you encountered no um I'll, I'll quickly just comment i'd love to hear what michaela and kayla have to say i it's almost the opposite it's like i have to work i feel like i i'm expected not only to get up there if i dare to say that i'm a magician i have to be I have to be good, but I have, to, I have to be, forgive me, I have to really get in their face and get in there and show them that I, I deserve this and I deserve the respect because I put the work into it. I, I feel like because I work hard that they, my experience has been, I have received credit for that. Not because I'm a female, because I worked hard. Um, I kind of come at this from a different standpoint, I guess. So as when, for, again, for the first 18 years when of my life, I was, uh, I was assigned male and I kind of came from that lens of when I approached magic. So for me, for those first 18 years, when I was younger, I was very much embraced and very much accepted by the people in the local magic club. And um, sure, I, I think I, I always had these more feminine traits, but I think that was even kind of looked past. Um, but then when I started transitioning, it was almost the opposite. I really had to work for, to be taken seriously in magic, just as a whole, even though I was doing the same exact tricks, it was just me. Now that I'm perceived as a woman, people looked at me different. Like people looked at me differently, be even though I was doing the same things. So for me, it's almost like now I have to prove myself even more uh, when I'm performing and doing magic and I have to make sure that kind of like uh, what everybody said so far is that you have to make sure you everything that you do is even much more that better or like and for me that's been an interesting little study that I've found against I guess for myself just that double standard of being perceived one way and everybody loved it being perceived another way and it's like oh that was that was that was cool but yeah, so just that double standard, I think it's interesting. That's so interesting that you notice it yourself. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. So Augusto is asking, I'm wondering if the panel has a sense of different style, different or diverse styles of magic, styles that aren't male, white, etc. in the same way that say in music, there are different styles based on identities. How do well, you I think that's... That's a oh, personal ahead, choice. Yeah, sorry, Kayla. I was just going to say, I think right, my instinct is to say, I think it's a very personal choice, just as it is in music. Um, I I don't see it as male magic or female magic, um, but, or choices. I think uh, I do what works for my personality though. So because I identify in this, in this female form in the way that I do it, that's how I choose the pieces I like to do. And I, I'm a pleaser. I want people to like me. So I do, I do tricks that, you know, depending on the situation, I have a routine or I have a bunch of tricks. Like it, it depends. And it really does depend as I'm sure Kayla and Michaela will say exactly like Michaela's just getting ready to do an, a show. So there's a set. Whereas if we were getting together with some friends um, and we're doing something, it's very casual. So you, you choose your moment and you pick, the, I think that's the secret is picking the right effect at the right time to create the essence and the, and the moment of magic. But I, I don't see it as a, as a distinctive form that way. I mean, I see women doing illusion shows just as males do. I, is that, 
Is that the kind of thing that we're, we're looking at? I mean, I think it's all across the board, sort of even in choice. I think there's also a, almost a societal or community standard for what male, feminine, that that kind of uh, theme. I think there's a, a specific way that a lot of the community views it. And my experience in this is that um, when I was 13 years old, uh, a magician who was helping me with my act told me and my parents that I needed to dress more sexy on stage in order to appeal to the audience. Um, obviously, that didn't go over very well with my parents because uh, I was 13. And so that's just a, something that I've experienced up until literally last year, or right, right before the pandemic. You know, you need to be more sexy on stage. You need to be more feminine. I'm not a, a quote unquote very feminine person. I chose to be more comedic in my performance because I that's who I am as a natural human being. And so I, I wanted to be more personality driven. Um, I choose my costume based off of comfort as, as opposed to sex appeal. And I think that I, I'm constantly told you're not feminine enough. You're not sexy enough on stage. You need to know how to appeal to the audience. And I just don't agree with that. I think I appeal to the audience just fine because of my uh, intense personality that's very, very clear on stage. And I work very hard to make sure of that. So in my opinion and the opinion of people that I view as my mentors and that they're, I respect their opinion, no, I don't think that I need to do that. But there is very much, I know a lot of uh, my friends in magic who are black have experienced the, you need to do more of X, Y, and Z because that's the audience expects you to be more quote black. Um, I had someone once tell me that I need to meet the audience where I'm at, so I should come out as the assistant. And you know, the, the magician didn't show up today, so I need now need to do the show because that's where the audience is. And I don't agree with any of that. I don't think there should be a standard, but I think that there kind of gets pushed on us as standard. Um, and for those of us that you know, are doing what we do, that are doing us, I think that our acts are much stronger. I have many friends that per, that went into that standard and are not happy with their experience in, in their career um, because they felt like they had to do that. So I think it's really important that you do you, as Julie said, just be you. <laughs> and that that's all that uh, you should do. And there should be no standard, even though I think sometimes there is. <laughs> that was a long answer. I'll <laughs> shut up now. Mute. No, I, I, I actually, I, I like that. Um, just be you. Uh, I've kind of, I've realized that traditionally, like women on stage are very much supposed to be kind of, as Kayla said, that like very kind of beautiful and elegant, and that's what's to be expected. And I'm. I'm also very much more of a comedy performer. I do a lot of stand-up comedy as well. And in just doing stand-up comedy when I was before I transitioned, I did a little bit of it, but not a whole lot. But even then, I realized that just the way people perceive jokes and when things hit, it tends for me personally, it tends to be a, a bit more skewed towards, oh, or like there, there just seems to be this this wall that's put up. Um, when an audience is watching a woman do comedy versus when they're watching a man do comedy. And I don't, and I think that seems for me personally, I think that also seems to be true a little bit with magic as well. So just that double standard of just when one versus the other does something. So it's, it's interesting. It kind of fascinates me, but it's something that I'm hoping that all of us by performing and just being ourselves can kind of get past. And I think that's really my biggest takeaway when doing magic is the more that you're just yourself on stage, the more that the audience learns to appreciate you as a person and maybe less so about your gender, gender identity or um, your race or anything like that. Just be you on stage and the audience can come to appreciate that. I think just to quickly tack on to that, Michaela, it's the idea of also being visible in that representation as much as you are being you. I think that's important that I have, I've never stopped to think about the the young people in my audiences I, it, not in the sense of what's the impact on the long-term basis that's what I mean you know I was there just to do the show I want to do a great show I want them to have fun I want them to feel like they've experienced some magic I was really in the moment and it was when I started to meet individuals afterward especially in the children's program that I worked with 
So I would see kids after a period of time to, to hear from them. They educated me to say, you know, we need to see more women doing this or more Asian women doing this because there's this, there, there are stereotypes that we're, we're facing. So to face those stereotypes, then you have to also educate and perform and show that these things can be not only met, but really to question what you think thought was to be expected. And again, to change those expectations so that we broaden and it comes back to conversation and and exposure and opportunity to share this in these important, meaningful points of of young people and and in, in general, like larger groups of people, not just our small magic community. Yeah, uh, um, you just mentioning young people, uh, people are chatting in the chats about how um, female or male students engage more in uh, courses based on magic. Do you see more diversity in courses in Magic Anna, for instance? I do. I, I certainly see um, a, almost always a strong mix of, of girls and boys in that, you know, I work with a huge range of kids. And the My Magic Hands program was developed for at-risk communities. It was to provide magic as a, as a form of recreation, but in a healthy way to offer opportunities without being tremendously cost um, heavy for parents to invest in. So it, be, it was started off as a recreation program that we provided in many different areas of, of Toronto. And it was concentrated in the GTA, the greater Toronto area. And it then evolved and became very heavily part of the rehabilitation program. So I saw quite a large cross-section of the community in Toronto. And then moving into the hospital situation, I moved across like more of a provincial cross-section. And parents saw me as a form of helping their child meet their therapeutic goals. And in doing that, magic shifted for the child by and large from being um, therapy. So the, it was repetitive. I was thinking of the shuffling exercises I was showing them and it moved from being a therapeutic exercise, being with me to a recreational one. And it shifted the children's thinking and the way they approach their goals and how they latched on. Like we all do in these obsessive ways about playing with cards or we're having our tendencies to, you know, I was learning how to do a closed shuffle and I didn't realize all the muscles that it engaged here in our forearms that some of my clients were having trouble with, especially the older kids. They saw me doing it and it was cool. It was like Kayla saying, like it had that crossover of like kind of pokery, kind of, you know, game playing. And it gave them a skill that they could work on. We weren't doing false shuffling. This is pure, regular, but table shuffles. And the idea that we could do this It didn't matter if you were female or not. It didn't matter if you were missing an arm or not. You know, we found ways of doing this. And that was my my whole experience is that um, magic became very accessible all of a sudden. So the gender question or the diversity question kind of went out the window because it was by client for me, you know, and I didn't know the client's history for for the sake of um, our program. And that was good. I didn't know... It, what the brain injury was so that sometimes maybe an arm was not in use. Maybe it was. And one of the most powerful experiences I had was I so, I so always told the kids, you want it when you're at the end of the show, you have to signal you're done, but one ahead for your tummy, one behind bed your head and bend in the middle. Okay. Well, one of my little clients had a, um, a stroke and she, she was partially paralyzed six years old. And uh, so in her mind, she was always telling herself what we said at the, at, to do. You put one hand here, you do one hand, but she couldn't lift that other arm. Okay. So we just kept doing it. At the dress rehearsal, I don't know what happened. Something fired. She raises her arm to put it there and she does the bow. We were all in tears and floored and overwhelmed. Like it's a very powerful thing to see. So for me, the magic speaks to the individual, you know, and it's, Very important that we continue to reach all young people if they want it, to let them fluidly move from one activity to the other, because I think that's how their world works and why shouldn't it? So I think magic can be very easily a part of this this fluid way of moving. Um, Just, I I would love to touch on this too. Uh, That's awesome, Julie, that's a great story. Um, In terms of just the 
what happens as people grow through their time in magic is my experience has always been there's there's a good amount of diversity in beginning classes even for adults not just kids but there's a good amount <clears throat> and then that goes away and sometimes it goes away pretty quickly and sometimes it goes away within the you know i'm a i'm an instructor at the magic castles university program and my level one class is 18 students and 65 percent of them uh, are women and there are many people of color and it's awesome the room is so amazing it's just the perspectives and it's such it's so great and my concern is and what has happened in the past is that they go to level two and most of the uh people drop off most of the women most of the people of color they leave and I have this theory called that I call the brick theory, which is every time something happens where it feels like you're not supposed to be doing this, whether it's a microaggression, whether it's, oh, your hands aren't big enough, whether it's, you know, et cetera. Oh, I want to learn this, and uh, but I don't have pockets and I don't know another way to do this. Um, a layer of brick gets laid. Oh, you don't see a magician that looks like you for the first 15 <laughs> years of your life. That's my experience. Uh, then a layer of brick and these bricks get laid until this wall becomes too tall for you to jump over and sometimes it's one layer of brick you're you're too tired you're done and sometimes it's years and years and years and this massive wall and people are helping you get over it and it's great but then it's just it becomes too troublesome and for me i quit magic when i was 18 years old and i had no interest in doing it anymore because i didn't want to jump over that wall i was done uh and i came back to it with a sledgehammer, and I'm very thankful I did. Uh, still, always getting bricks laid, but I think that's why people quit. I think that's why women quit. I think that's why people of color quit. I think that's why people who uh, have a disability quit because they don't see how magic could be done if they're themselves. And so that, to me, is why I think that those numbers trail off. Which goes back to the whole point of why you need to be up there teaching those courses, why we need to continually put a diverse and broad range of individuals on the stage performing magic, because that's the world now. It's no longer a small, um, closed group. I think that it, we're, we're also a tiny community as the globe. Look at how many countries and cities we're in right now on this on this call. I mean, that's the point. We can share our experiences and find opportunities and support one another in doing that. I think that's a great way to end the webinar on this positive note. It was really, really nice to have all of you here today. It was a very stimulating discussion. I, I'd love to talk about it more. So I'd like to thank uh, again, everyone for being here today. That's how we're gonna advance on this type of issues. I uh, hope you found the discussion stimulating because I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone did. Thanks everyone.